Amen. We're doing part two called Becoming a Father Pleaser. A uh, really quick review. Uh, last week I shared that there's a new emphasis on discipleship in these days, but it's not the old traditional method or model of discipleship that we've probably been used to in our, uh, maybe when we first became a Christian, you know, where people are taught a number of do's and don'ts um, so that they can behave in a certain socially acceptable way. Now, now, that is important that there are behavioral norms for different environments. But, but if that's all our discipleship is, a bunch of do's and don'ts, we have really missed it because the problem is you can treat, you can treat or teach a dog to perform a certain way. But that doesn't mean that they're anything still but a dog, Right? They have been transformed into God's image. They're just learning how to behave. And God doesn't want us to learn how to behave. He wants to transform us into his very image, in the image of his son. So God God is teaching us uh, a really a, a, a biblical, a more biblical way of doing discipleship based upon God is our father. Okay, God is our Father, not a, a judge, a scary judge in the sky, but God is our Father, and we are His sons and daughters. That has always been true, but somehow we've missed that over the years, that God wants to relate to us in a fatherly way uh, and, and, and take us each day from a place, uh, living each day from a place of abiding in Him, learning how to abide in Him in His presence so that we experience His greatest desire, which is to bless us, and our greatest desire is to give him pleasure back to him, to, to thank him for what he's doing in our lives. So it's a, a mutual thing. It's almost like a mutual admiration society where he's loving on us and we're loving on him. And then he's loving on us and we're loving on him. And in that place of, of abiding in him and his love, there is transformation. I read this verse, John chapter 14, verse 2. It says, in my Father's house are many abiding places. That's in your notes today. In my Father's house are many abiding places. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare an abiding place for you. There is a place in God that is perfectly perfectly designed just for you. It fits you perfectly. And it's a place that takes into full account your personality and the way that God created you and all your quirks and stuff. And God said, as you are, come, and there's an abiding place for you where you can be in my presence and live out of my presence. And as we live each day from that place of abiding, then we are truly transformed and matured, but not by focusing on our problems and trying to fix all our problems, but instead by focusing on what we say last week, on the kingdom of the Father and the righteousness of the Father. Said another way, focusing on His rule and His character. And as we focus on his rule, just doing what he says to us, and and, and focusing on his character, getting to know him as he truly is, and letting that overflow in our lives, that's the place of true transformation. So we've discovered, well actually that's the verse, Matthew chapter 6, 33, seek first God's kingdom, that's God's rule, and God's righteousness, that's his rightness, his character, and then all these other things that we need will be added to us as we get those two things straight. You know, I'm discovering more and more in my life, you know, there are, there are wonderful biblical principles about leadership. There are wonderful biblical principles about uh, how to work in the marketplace, finances, stewardship, all these other things. But folks, I'm telling you that unless you let God change your heart, none of that other stuff matters. Because if you don't have a whole heart, you're still going to have trouble with finances. If you don't have a whole heart, if you're not secure in the Lord and confident in the Lord, it doesn't matter what position you gain in your company you're still going to struggle because you're not walking in a place of security in the Lord. But you know what? If you let God work on your heart, as for example, Joseph did let God work on his heart, he was promoted to the top of every organization he was in. Not because of all the biblical skills he knew in terms of leadership, but because he was secure in his relationship with the Lord. You know, and that really is, I'm discovering, you know, even in the church, what's, you know, the greatest preachers do not make the greatest pastors or not make the greatest church leaders because there's a place of insecurity still in their hearts. You know, and, and so God wants to bring us all to that place of abiding in Him. We're, we're secure in Him. And if you're secure in the Lord and you know Him, if you seek first His kingdom, His rule, and His righteousness, His character, 
then all these things will be added. You will go far both in the kingdom and in the marketplace. But so often people cave in. And it's not due to the fact they don't have the skills. It's because there's still issues in their hearts that have not been dealt with. So, you know, as I said, we're going to look at this a lot in the fall and into the spring. Where we're going to redo um, life ceiling choices in, in October and also knowing God as Father in October to really become secure in who we are in Christ. Let him transform us. And, and I'm going to teach some other things about the core realities of the Christian life. And you're going to see that as we embrace them, God will be able to do great things through our lives, okay? So we discovered that it's not... that God changes not just what we think about, but the very process of how we think. Because again, you can have a a mind full of biblical knowledge, but you can still come to the wrong conclusions if you haven't allowed God to change the processes of your thought life. Happy birthday, Heidi. (laughs) <laughs> I just <laughs> I, and, I, and I won't even tell them how old you are today but it's a milestone isn't it I think so bless you you're looking good <laughs> look what I did happy birthday dear Heidi <laughs> oh dear <laughs> now this is a big one for Imram too I think too eh? so God bless you happy birthday this is really messing up my message isn't it but anyway love you guys so we looked last week at some foundations for becoming a father pleaser and a father who or a, a, a father pleaser is a child of God who who desires to to go beyond uh, uh, just being in a relationship with their father and wants to actually please, to give their father pleasure. Because as I shared last week, there's a big difference between our, our fathers loving us and our fathers being pleased with us. In my children growing up, the, I always loved them, but sometimes they didn't really give me too much pleasure. And God wants, as one of my daughters sits in the front row and looks at me, yeah. And, and, and you know, so we want to become father pleasers. So that we can actually become accustomed to him saying to us, as in Matthew 3.17, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. Not just pleased, but well pleased. You know, still today, we may hear that now and then, but we're not accustomed to it. And God wants us to come to a place where we're so accustomed to us hearing those words, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter, in whom I'm well pleased. Because in that is such a place, in that place is such a, uh, there's such a place of security and confidence in the Lord. And that's what he wants for us. So I want to talk today about change. As I said last week, uh, good news, change is here to stay. Okay? Change is going to be the constant. If you're looking for some consistency in your life, here's the thing you can totally confidently count on for the rest of your life is change. Okay? (laughs) See, one of the reasons God is trying to teach us a new way of being discipled by Him is that God is in the process right now, in case you haven't noticed, He's in the process right now of bringing massive change to His worldwide church. You know, um... Change is going to be the reality for the rest of our lives. Right now, we are entering into the most uh, serious, complicated, um, undefined period in church history because God is wanting to change the very fabric of how we relate to Him, how we relate to each other, how we live as Christians in this world. See, there's a very uh, aggressive resurgence of the kingdom of God right now. The kingdom of God is advancing around the world. They said in another 10 years, Brazil should be 50% evangelical Christians. There's such a movement of the Spirit of God. Uh, There are so many things happening around the world today. Uh, um, Miracles, signs and wonders, transformations. Uh, uh, The kingdom of of God is really advancing forcefully. It's increasing every day. And, And God is going to increase the demands of the kingdom on us. He really is. Okay, until we, until we really learn what it means to be a father pre- pleaser. You know, uh, church as we know it is disappearing. 
Church as we know it is disappearing where we can come in and comfortably sit for an hour or two on Sunday morning and, 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 and have the freedom to be, live as Christians in this world. It's all changing. And God is, is going to, by His Spirit, challenge us to, to really understand what it means to be a Christian, to be one in Christ. Um, the concept of an inactive Christian is going to disappear, right? There'll be no such thing in a couple years. You'll either be functioning and active in your Christian life, or you'll be on the sidelines. Okay, God is changing us and challenging us in those areas. And, you know, and honestly, a lot of uh, traditional church behavior is no longer going to be tolerated by God. You know, our sloppiness... Uh, some of the nonsense that we, you know, a lot of churches put up with, division and gossip and all those things. God is going to challenge all those things because he's getting ready to do some major changes in the church. And, and for some people it's going to be really difficult, but it's all going to be good because God is preparing her, his bride, okay, Jesus' bride. And, and so God is aggressively coming to us and confronting us with our relationship with Him. And that's why it's so important for us to understand this concept of Father Pleaser right now. Because it's going to force each one of us, as the kingdom of God advances, it's going to force each one of us into a really um, rather severe and very unpleasant reassessment of our lives. Right? God wants, God is going to force us to reassess our lives and really get us to make a choice between two things, and I put them in your, no, in your notes there. there. There's the human force of the need to preserve my personal reputation in the presence of other people. You know, to always look good, to always uh, put on a good show that people think highly of me, people like me. You know, God's going to cause us to challenge, He's going ch- to challenge us to either choose A, the human force of the need to preserve my personal reputation in the presence of other people, or B, the spiritual force of the need to preserve my personal integrity in the presence of God. Okay? Uh, uh, Bill Hybels wrote a book many, many years ago called Who Are You When No One's Looking? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a pretty powerful book. And it's a simple book, but it asks the very uncomfortable question, who are you when nobody else is around? Are you still the person of integrity? Are you still presenting yourself in a way that's in line with the, the God within you? You know, And God is challenging us in our private lives, in our relationships, in, our, in the marketplace. Are, are, are we people of integrity? And God's going to cause us to choose. And it's going to be a challenging time, but God is trying to refine us, okay? Because if you're walking around your life in guilt and shame, you cannot be used by God to the degree that he has created you to be used. Okay, you cannot do the things that God has called you to do if you're always keeping secrets, if you're, if you're living under the weight of guilt for secret sins and secret habits and things like that. Uh, you're not, you know, the, the shame will keep you down. God wants us to be truly free, not just free in our outward behavior, but truly free that we actually have a new way of thinking. We have a new way of living. We have a new way of relating to him. We have a new way of relating to each other. And that's why we're bringing in Eli Miller in September to teach us kingdom relationships. And we're going to look at, in September, we're going to look at kingdom relationships in terms of God, kingdom relationships in terms of each other, and kingdom relationships in terms of our spouses. <laughs> There's a good one, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be really good. Yeah. So, um, so God's going to want us, God's challenging us to choose some things. And, you know, I, I heard recently a minister say that when he first came to his church, his whole church saw him as angels as an angel, but as he started to really choose God over everything else and choose personal integrity over people-pleasing, he said all the backbiters in his church chewed away his wings and he's no longer an angel to them. <laughs> as something in that. You know, um, you won't please everybody when you choose the Lord. You really won't. Um, you know, <laughs> I heard someone say, "Well, you know, now, 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 Dave, you don't, you know, you don't want to get too zealous and become a fanatic, you know." So I started. I looked up the definition of fanatic. <laughs> you, you know what a fanatic is? A fanatic is someone who is someone who is just a little bit more spiritual than you are. <laughs> that's a. 
<laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I think God puts fanatics in our life to call us upward. Okay? Because <laughs> you may just get convicted when the fanatics show up. You may get uncomfortable, but that's a good thing. So, you know, we have to be honest with the Lord in these days. That's what this is all about. And you know what? We, we do compromise so much. Well, well, oh, yeah, I know you did that. But it's okay. God will forgive you. It's okay. God will forgive you. Yeah, he probably will, but he won't be pleased with you. Really. You know? Um, oh, don't worry about that. God understands those little things we have to do to get by in the world today. God will forgive you. It's okay. Yeah. We're not talking about God's forgiveness today. We're talking about God's pleasure. We're talking about pleasing God. See, because it's, it's not the issue is God going to forgive you. Of course God is for, going to forgive you. He loves you. He is absolutely head over heels in love with you. As soon as you say, oh, God, please for me, give, you, give me, he, of course he's going to forgive you, but that's not the issue anymore. Is God going to forgive you? The issue is, are you going to be a father pleaser? Because a father pleaser isn't interested in personal comfort or pleasure. A father pleaser is simply interested in pleasing the father. Okay? Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness and it's peace and it's joy in the Holy Spirit. See? And we say, oh, well, yeah, but if you do that, God will forgive you. Yeah, he probably, probably will, but you won't have the righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so we have all these Christians asking God to forgive them every day, and they're walking in depression, they're walking in guilt, they're walking in shame. Because they've based their Christian life is on will God forgive us or not? Rather than will this please God or not? Okay? You know, but see, when you think about personal comfort, when you think about your own pleasure, you really haven't sought first his kingdom and his righteousness, his rule and his character. You know, and, and you remember, remember that old thing, what would Jesus do? You know, there's something in that. There really is. You know, when I need to discipline my children, the first question I should ask is, what would the Father do to me if I did that? Because that will totally change the way you discipline your kids. It really will. What would the Father do in this situation? It's a good thing to ask. Because if you don't, if we don't start to get focused on what it means to please the Father and how to please the Father, you will never get to know His voice that says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your Master's joy. This is my beloved Son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. You know, I... I <laughs> I don't want God to just put up with me. I just I don't want God to just put up with me. I want him to be pleased with me, to be well pleased with me. I, I, anyway, <laughs> we'll move on. But if people wrong us, shouldn't we forgive them? Yes, we should forgive them. But the we but the purpose of forgiveness is not to let people off our hook. The purple of but the purple the purpose of forgiveness is so we can rebuild relationships, so we can draw them to ourselves and bring them in further into the kingdom of God and into His righteousness. You know, our motivation shouldn't be well. If I do that, will I lose my salvation? Our motivation should be, if I do this, will it give pleasure to the Father? It's not about whether God will forgive you or not. Of course He will. He's head over heels in love with you. He's head over heels in love with me. But will He find pleasure in me? Will He find pleasure in me? 
You know, we get so caught up in Christian liberty. You know, I'm no longer under the law. I am under grace. I can do whatever I want. But what is the consequence of you doing whatever you want? What is the witness of you doing whatever you want? What is the profit of you doing whatever you want? How many people are you hurting, offending, uh, uh, wronging by you doing whatever you want? See, Paul said all things are permissible, but not all things are profitable. And, you know, and, and Paul went on even further in, in, in uh, Romans. He said, if, meat, if eating may, meat offends my brother, he said, I won't even eat meat while the world remains because I don't want to offend any of my brothers. Now, it's a principle, and it doesn't just mean everybody should become vegetarians. It means that is your liberty going to cause someone else to fall? Is your liberty going to hurt someone? You know, the, the, so the question has to be, is the Father finding pleasure in what I'm doing? Now again, we're not going to do this in the flesh, right? We're not going to do it out of human effort, because if we do, we'll just develop new rules and become old dogs learning more new tricks, right? It's going to be done by His Spirit. It's going to be done by His Spirit works in us, and that's why we're going to teach you those principles this fall. But our heart has to start to move towards this mindset God, I want to be a father pleaser. I want to please you. I want to live in that place of abiding, because abiding, in that place of abiding in you, I'm going to be led by your spirit. I'm going to be uh, uh, strengthened by your spirit. I'm going to be motivated by your spirit. I'm going to be energized by your spirit. And, and all of my motives are going to be in line with what your Holy Spirit wants to do. And, and the whole issue about is it right, is it wrong, is going to be a non-issue in the future. You don't even, see, you don't have to know no rules and regulations. When, 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 when you're just walking as a father pleaser. You don't have to re- learn any rules. I remember once somebody came into the back area here. He, he came and he said, oh, church, eh? And I go, yeah, yeah. He said, what are the rules in this place? I said, oh, I, I'm not really sure we have any. He said, oh, everybody's got rules. What are the rules? I want to know the rules. Where's the book? There's got to be a big book of rules in this church. I go, I really don't think there is. You know? And he says, oh, come on. There must be one rule. And, he, and, and so I just said, um, how about... How about love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all, uh, uh, all your strength, and love your neighbors yourself? And he said, well, that can't be that simple. I went, <laughs> like, do, do you know what a big issue that is? Because Jesus himself said that all the law and all the prophets are on those two commandments. But to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength at every moment of the day and love your neighbor as yourself at every moment of every day, that's a big deal. And you can't do that in the flesh. You can't do that in human effort. You need God's help. But he just wanted to have a hundred rules. And if I can fulfill the hundred rules, I must, you know, make the church happy, make God happy. No. It's like, guys, you know, when you learn how to please your wife, you can't just do it that way for the rest of your life, can you? The rules change, right? Uh, hey, you, you, you can <laughs> I'm sorry, you, when I said guys, you, were, you, you ladies weren't supposed to listen. It's like, it's like the rules change, right? Because it's a dynamic relationship. <laughs> it's like, whoever was ducking under the chair said that. Okay, And it's the same with the Lord. There's no use just making rules. It's a dynamic relationship with God that... that, 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 that lives and breathes, right? It's, it's, it matures. It's, it's abiding in Him. It's abiding in Him. <laughs> okay. Moving on. Yeah. There's three realms of the kingdom, okay? These three realms exist at the same time all the time, but there are three distinct realms of the kingdom. They function simultaneously and they exist simultaneously. The first is the the kingdom of nature. The kingdom of nature, which is God's sovereignty. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's about God being creator and preserver of creation, and he's just sovereign, okay? 1 Corinthians 10, 26, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Okay, so it's the realm of both the natural laws and the spiritual laws, right? Gravity, uh, is a law. It just functions. God is sovereign. He's decided that what goes up has to come down, right? Gravity. But also spiritual laws like the law of sowing and reaping, that which you sow you shall reap, 
Okay, So there are spiritual laws and there are natural laws, but that's the law of God's sovereignty. Those things work even if you don't even understand them. You don't have to understand gravity to experience it. You don't have to understand sowing and reaping to experience it. You sow positively, you're going to get positive results. You, re- you sow negatively, you're going to get negative results. Okay? And in this realm, God doesn't function as Father. In this realm, God functions simply as the Creator, as, as the King. And, and, and sadly... This is where most Christians live. They just go stumble through their lives every day. Well, God is sovereign. Oh, just lost my God, my job. God must be sovereign. Oh, my marriage is falling apart. Well, God is sovereign. No. But that's where most Christians live. That everything that happens, they say, well, God's in charge. It's whatever happens. That's great. You know, uh, there's no human involvement necessary in the sovereignty of God in the kingdom of nature. But then there's a second level of the kingdom called the kingdom of grace. And that's where God's providential care comes into play, uh, where God is ever-present as loving Father. And he reveals his Father heart to us uh, when we give our lives to him. 2 Corinthians 8, or 6, 18, I will be a father to you. You will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And in this way, God exerts his rule and his influence in a more interactive way. It's not just the sovereignty of God, whatever will come, will come, whatever will be, will be kind of thing. It's where God wants to get involved in our lives and speak to us and almost become partners with us relationally and in ministry. Okay? Um, uh, first John, or sorry, John chapter 1, verse 12, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We become children of God, we enter into a relationship with, with him. Okay? And, and this is the second realm of the kingdom, God's uh, kingdom of grace, his providential realm, uh, where he invites us to choose to obey him. He doesn't force us, but he invites us now to come in and enter into his will, his mind, into his desires for our lives, pur- his purpose for creating us. And, and, and he wants to manifest himself to us in a providential way or a fatherly way. And, and um, when I, as a child of God, when I backslide, what I do is I leave that providential realm of his, of his kingdom and I move back into that sovereign realm. Okay? And when I repent, I move out of that sovereign realm back into his providential realm where I'm starting to relate to him as father again. I'm starting to relate to him in a fatherly way. Okay? And obviously that's a much better place to be but both are existing right now. And you can actually choose today to walk out of this place and walk as a child of his natural realm, the kingdom of nature, or you can, his, that place of God's sovereignty, or you can choose to walk home in that providential realm, the kingdom of grace, where there's an ongoing relationship with him. And no, you know him as father, just not as creator. Okay? But there's a third realm. It's called the kingdom of glory. And that's where God's manifest presence comes into play. Uh, for most people, it's the kingdom of the future, right? Where one day uh, uh, every knee will bow before him. Every person will see his glory. Um, it's available for us today, but very few choose to respond. Uh, most people are still back in the area of, of God's uh, uh, um, sovereignty or the area of God's providential care, and they haven't really walked every day in that place of his manifest presence where you're constantly hearing his voice, you're seeing his glory, you're seeing it in the spiritual realms. It's available, but very few take advantage of that. One day it's going to just be thrust on us. Okay? One day it's like the whole world will see the glory of God. Okay? Um, Romans chapter 14, verse, verse 11 is written, As surely as it lives, says the Lord, every knee, one day every knee will bow. They'll, they'll all see his glory. Every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will confess to God. And in that day, Habakkuk 2.14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord of the, as the waters cover the sea. That's going to be an amazing day. But there are people walking in that right now. There are people walking in God's glory today and seeing amazing things. Just absolutely amazing things. Uh, but the kingdom of glory really operates on a whole different realm. Just as the providential realm, the realm of the kingdom of grace, is a whole different level than the, the level of God's sovereignty, the level of God's glory is a whole different realm again. Um, because it's the realm where God is truly able to reveal and reflect his character and his heart on an ongoing basis to us. Okay? And... and Sadly, very few of us are living there. And, and part, one of my goals is, is to become more a liver in that third kingdom, that third, third realm of the kingdom, 
where I see his glory, glory on a greater degree. I know if not only for my sake, but for the world's sake, they need to see the glory of God in me and manifest through me, right? The whole of creation is eagerly longing for the manifestation, the full manifestation of the sons of God as the sons of God, where the glory of God is revealed through us. And that's the fun place to be, it really is. So for the last 2,000 years, up, up until 2,000 years ago, God revealed himself mostly in his kingdom of, um, what I say, a kingdom of nature, where he was revealing his sovereignty. But starting 2,000 years ago, he started to manifest himself in a brand new way, in a great, greater degree of grace. And he's wanting to move all of his children, all of the believers in Christ, from the realm of sovereignty to the realm of grace, from the realm of, of, of nature and sovereignty to into the realm of God's providential relationship, providential care. And, and, um, but God is wanting to take us even further than that. And why am I sharing all that? I'm sharing all that because we're going to start to see greater expressions of God's glory in the coming days. But it's going to take people with a heart positioned as father pleasers to really respond properly. You know, it's, it's like a woman in labor. You know, when there's a woman in labor, there's a lot of sweat, there's a lot of pain. Like, things look bad. If you didn't know what was going on, you'd be scared to death, right? And yet, that gives birth to life. In the middle of the pain, the sweat, the, the, the turmoil, you're given birth to life. And over the next ten years, folks, I am just, just thought I'd warn you, as the kingdom of glory starts to manifest more and more in the world it's going to look really bad. There's going to be a lot of confusion and sweat and pain and fear and all this stuff. And, and for a lot of people, it's going to look like death. It's going to look like crisis. It's going to look like disaster. But God is wanting to birth life into this world. He's wanting to birth something new into this world. But the majority of people are not going to get it because they haven't understood what God is trying to do. And they haven't learned how to position their hearts as a father pleaser. Because even when you don't know what's going on, you can still respond in such a way as to please the father. Okay? So, what are some characteristics of what God is about to do? And these, were, you know, these, these are things that the prophets have been saying for the last number of years. But here's four things it's going to be. This, this new advancement of the kingdom of God as it impacts both on the earth and on the church is going to be, number one, disruptive. It's going to mess things up. It's going to mess up our dogmatism, our theological certainty on certain issues. It's going to destroy our sacred cows. Okay? It's going to disrupt some of the idealism we have, the materialism we bought into, the skepticism that some of us have embraced. It's, this advancement of God's kingdom is going to be very disruptive. It's going to be reformational. God is going to intentionally reform the church. It will look different. At its very fabric, it will look different. There's a lot of expressions of the church these days, but God is wanting to reform all that to something that, that really gives him pleasure. Number three, it's going to be unmanageable. It's going to be disorderly and unmanageable. And, and, and again, if you're into order, the, then you're going to have trouble being, being part of a church because God is wanting to bring some changes that, that even the leaders will not be able to manage because they're going to happen so forcefully. The church is going to be forced to change in our society. Okay. And number four, it's going to be unstoppable. You know, there are those that think that this can be pre prevented, it can be uh, stopped, because we're not going to invite them. You know, like it's like, no, we're not allowing that in this church. <laughs> well, God's bigger than that. You know, it's like, man, God is so much bigger than that. He wants to come and change us. And to say, well, I didn't invite anybody to do that. Well, yeah, but God wants, the Father wants to change us and change the church. And, and, and it's going to be for the purpose of causing us to grow up. Yeah, just turn to your neighbor and just lovingly say, grow up. <laughs> hey, I got two on. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. See, and, and, and now, now, now we, we've probably used that in a negative way in the past, 
but God wants to come alongside of us by His Spirit, move us into that place of abiding, and then cause us to grow up. Okay? We don't have to protect ourselves anymore. We don't have to justify ourselves anymore. We don't have to, you know, just become a God, a Father pleaser. Okay, so here, we're going to try to get through these quickly. Uh, seven changes. Seven changes that are definitely coming. And more so than these seven changes coming, I'm going to talk to you about how do we respond to these seven changes as father pleasers. Because there's going to be, on, again, there's going to be one whole sector of the church that's going to resist these seven changes. And, and it's probably going to cause some churches to blow up. Okay? And there are Christians that are going to resist these seven changes. And it's going to cause some Christians to blow up. Okay? Because God is bringing these changes... And they're not negotiable. As I said, they're disruptive. They're reformationable. They're unmanageable. They're unstoppable. But we could actually cooperate. Because there's one thing, you know, there's one, it's one thing when the tidal wave is coming and it's one thing to stand there and dig your heels in and say, you know, I dare you and let it wash right over you, right? It's another thing to say, oh, the tidal wave's coming, grab a surfboard and get on the wave, right? Like, it is, one way you're going to be hurt, one way you're not, okay? The wave is coming. <laughs> catch the wave there we go catch the wave okay change change number one change number one there's going to be a change in kingdom realm from sovereign to providential what that means is that as, as the kingdom of glory comes every Christian is going to move out of the first realm to the second realm that will be a new basis no Christian will be able to live in the sovereign realm anymore where they just walk around every day going whatever you know God whatever you want like God is God and I'll just be blown away blown along carried along by God's sovereignty no in this God in the next I you know 10 years maybe 20 every Christian will be pressed to move out of that sovereign realm of the kingdom into that providential realm where we all know him as father where we even don't even use the word God anymore, except in a very reverential manner. You know, and I've been trying to force myself that. If you notice today, I've been, I've been trying to use the word Father, Father this, Father that, to, to start to change my thinking that He's my Father. And there's going to become a day when every Christian says, Father, not just God, God spoke to me, but you know what? The Father spoke to me. Father, Father ministered to me last night. Father blessed me today. Father led me. God, Father showed me this, right? It's all going to be Father. Because we're really going to know the Father in a providential manner. Or said another way, the providential God, or the sovereign God, is pressing us to know Him as Father. You know, the sovereign God is pressing us to know Him as Father. Because it's all going to be about the Father. And, and, and God is going to come in and press us into really unintentionable and uncompromisable changes in our lives and in our relationship with Him. Um, from living under His sovereignty to living in an experiential relationship of knowing Him as Father. And He's going to use whatever He can to make that change. Right? I remember when, you know, in the Old Testament when God started to use some of the, the four nations to bring Israel the king of Israel, or the the, uh, the the Jews and the king of Israel into a better understanding of, of of the Father. He actually used foreign nations, even in evil nations, and they're standing there getting wiped out, going, "God can't use this. God can't use this." And, and they missed it. God is allowed to use whatever He wants to bring us into that place where we are desperately aware of His presence and desperately need Him. Okay. You know, and we're too busy, you know, again, we're, often we're rebuking the very things that God is trying to use to change us. You know, like we're worshiping God and everything's going great, and then all of a sudden God says, you really got to do with that attitude of bitterness in your heart. And you go, I rebuke you, Satan, I'm worshiping God. And it comes back again. I really want to deal with that, that bitterness in your heart. Ah, oh, Satan, you just got to... Like you're interrupting my worship. You can't be God. You're interrupting my worship. But dealing with that attitude of bitterness is worship. Right? Right? <laughs> Get your mind around that one, yeah. So how, how do we respond as, as, father ple as a father pleaser as he moves us from the sovereign realm into the providential realm? And what it means is as father pleasers, we're just going to say, yes, Lord, Whatever methods you want to use to press me into the image of your son, I'm willing to cooperate with. 
Now, that's a tough one for a lot of us, right? Because sometimes, you know, God, God is tender, but sometimes he presses a bit. And, and, and if we resist, you know, you know like, if, if I... One sec. I take this cup, and I kick it. That didn't hurt my foot. You know why? It wasn't resisting. If I kick this, that hurt a bit. <laughs> why? It was resisting. And it's the same thing when God tries to change us, when he tries to bring transformation in our lives. Some people, they're just flowing with what God's doing, and it's a joy-filled experience. They're riding the wave. And other people are just struggling and just wiped out and exhausted. exhausted. Why? Because you're resisting what God is doing. If we're going to be father-pleasers, we have to cooperate with this thing that God is doing in our lives. Uh, God is going to use both the comfortable and the uncomfortable to transform us because he wants to conform us into the image of his Son. Romans 8.29, for, for those God foreknew, he breast, predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. It's, it's, it's not about predestination to salvation or not salvation. God has predestined, he has a destiny for each one of us to come into his character, to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's what this is all about. And, and God's going to use the uncomfortable. But a father pleaser will not resist the uncomfortable. When God starts to put his finger on something and change you in an area, are you going to try to justify why you have the habit you have? Are you going to justify why you have the, uh, the attitude you have? Or are you just going to say, yes, Lord, thanks for pointing that out. I'm going to submit to it, you know? Because you're either going to cooperate or not cooperate. You're going to resist or not resist. And God knows our heart and he knows our character are so much more important than our comfort level. Right? See, God is not out to always make us happy. He's out to transform us so that we will have a fulfilled and full, abundant life with joy. And, and there's some uncomfortable stuff on the road to joy, right? Okay, so that's the first change, from sovereign to providential, from knowing God in sovereignty to knowing God in his fatherly love. And he's going to do that by transpressing us through certain things until we start running to him as father, okay? And that, a father pleaser, that's how he responds. We used to say, yes, Lord. Number two, there's going to be a change in our identities from title to relationship. Okay, John chapter thirty or John chapter ten verse thirty. Jesus said, "I and the Father are one. We really are one, because my identity is wrapped up in the Father. My identity is in the Father." It's interesting because this was actually the way it was in the quote old days. What's your name? Hi, my name is Davidson, which means I'm the son of David. In, in Jewish, what it's uh, it's it's bar bar Jesus, bar this, bar that, because it's son of this person. Everybody was known by, their, almost everybody in, in, in the early Jewish uh, um, culture was bar something, because the word bar means son of, okay? And, and for so long, people were known by who their father was. And somewhere along the way, we all got our own identities and our own names and everything like that. Um, but God is wanting to turn us back to where our identity is not in our title, Hi, I'm, you know, like, hi, I'm the pastor. I'm Dave. I am David. That's who I am. My function is pastor. My role is pastor. But that's not who I am. Okay? God wants to change us from living out of our offices and out of our titles to living out of sonship. Okay? Well, you know, when we have grasped the fatherhood of God, um, then titles and offices, they lose their charm anyway. Why would you want to be known by your title when you can be known by being a son of God, a daughter of God? Okay? You know, titles have their place. They are useful. Um, they have a function. But we will increasingly start finding our authority and our confidence increasing as we, as we just function and intentionally become one with the Father in our identity. Okay? How do we respond to a father pleaser? Since God is trying to... Uh, transform us from title to relationship, how do we respond as father-pleasers? Um, well, we make sure that our identity is derived completely 
not from our office or our title, but only from our place of sonship. We just make sure that as we function every day, it's not about what my title is, it's about who my father is. And I walk as a son of God. See, because too many people act like their title. Right? Well, I'm the boss. Right? I'm the senior supervisor. Now, yeah, but, but if you have a title, stop acting like it and start acting like a son or daughter. Okay? That's what I'm saying. We act like a son or daughter who is seeking to please our father. And we allow our, our title to be, let God use our title to press us into oneship with the father. So that what it's all about, our identity with him. See, and, and if I live as a father pleaser, um, I'm going to be brought into intimacy with the father so that I can claim him as my father. See, if I become a father pleaser, not only am I going to be able to claim him as my father, this is my father, father this, father that. Ah, am I my father one? He's leading me, he's guiding me. Not only am I going to be able to claim him as father, but he's going to be able to claim us as son or daughter. And there's a whole Im- implication to that. Because so many people, uh, they, they live as orphans, not as sons or daughters of God. Okay? So if we get to claim God as our father, he gets to claim us as a son or daughter. Right? Okay. Number three, third change. There's going to be a change in ministry from using Scripture to living Scripture. What do I mean by that? So much of the church has been um, using the scripture legalistically, argumentatively, religiously. God is going to change his church from using scripture that way to a more human, love-filled, and Christ-centered application of what really does or doesn't please God the Father. Okay? You know, in most circles, where the most Bible is quoted, the least love is shown. Right? Like, that's scary. Because they haven't used Scripture to minister life, but to bring death and correction and, and, and conform, forming, whatever, the conformant, whatever, yeah, to, 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 to the rules of the local church. We use the Bible to correct, we use the Bible to, to rebuke, to punish, to demand, to pressure, to manipulate. See, because I can either crucify you with verses or I can restore you with those same verses. You know, it's, it's all in the use. And folks, the world is absolutely sick of us using Bible verses to condemn them. You know, just absolutely sick of us trying to use Bible. You know, what, you did that? You're going to hell. You gambled? You're going to hell. Well, number one, that's not even biblical. There's only one reason people go to hell. See, because if we could get everybody in the whole world to stop doing that, then that means they're all going to heaven? No. Heaven and hell is determined solely by your relationship with Jesus. And yet we use the scripture to try to scare people to accept Jesus by telling them if they don't, if they don't stop doing this, they're going to go to hell. So we're actually misusing the word of God to use fear and manipulation to try to get people to come into a loving relationship with Jesus. That's like the shotgun wedding. Do you love me? Say yes or I'll shoot you. And yet that's how we use Scripture. Repent and get right with God or you're going to hell. That's got to stop. <laughs> what, you try that one last week? Is that what you... No. <laughs> no, okay. So, see, instead of using the Bible to manipulate and condemn and control the behavior of others, we need to learn how to use the Scriptures to discover how God the Father would respond to people in those situations. You know, understanding that God is providential. Yes, God offers limitless forgiveness in Christ. He has unlimited affection for humanity. So how would he respond to that disappointment, to that particular failure in your life or someone else's life? How do we respond as Father Pleaser, knowing that he is going to transform the church from using Scripture to living Scripture? 
Well, we, we start to use the Bible. We get up in the morning and we... Oh, I left my Bible over there. We get up in the morning not to get the Bible to give a good verse to go after somebody for the day, but we get up in the Bible and say, God, we get up in the morning and look at the Bible and say, God, speak to me through your word. Say something to me through your word. Okay? Not to use the Bible anymore to find ammunition to use on others, but use the Bible to discover how God would respond to sin in our lives and other people's lives. You say, well, sin is sin. Yeah, but woman caught in adultery. Those Pharisees, they found lots of verses to justify stoning her to death, right? But Jesus says, no, no, no. <laughs> How do he use Scripture? John 8, verse 11. I, I, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. I know what the Word says. I know what the judgment is. I know what you are guilty of and worthy of, what the penalty of your sin is, but I'm going to give you a better way. And the better way is turn your life around and just stop it. Because God's love is always reconciliation, always reformation. A a father-pleaser understands that the spirit in which a Bible verse is used is often more important than the Bible verse itself. And I said that, and I half agree with it. (laughs) Because the Word of God is important. The Word of God changes us. But you can nullify the power and the effect of that verse if you use it with a wrong motivation. That's what I'm trying to say. And so as a result, the spirit in which you give the verse will either give that verse power or nullify the power of that verse. Okay? A father pleaser uses scripture in a manner that pleases the father. Okay. Number five. Actually, number four, sorry. Number four. There's going to be a change in our motive from taking to giving. Now, this is a challenging one even for me because I started to see some things recently in my own life. Um, Maybe you're going to see it too. As Christians... As the church, most people see the church as a taker, not a giver. Okay? Um, we, have, we were having the picnic yesterday, and this one woman said, Oh, this is really good. So this, the school is doing this. Hey, this is uh, some sort of ministry of the school. I said, Oh, no, this is a local church doing this. She went, What? Local church would put on this free event for us? Right? Because church is for taker, Right? We just want your, your, we want your money and we want your presence. <laughs> That's what most people think. But as the kingdom of God advances in these days, God wants to transform our motives for ministry. Because so, so much of our ministry is motivated by a need to possess, a need to acquire, and a need to control. And as I said, we don't often see it, but the world sees the present-day church as a taker. You know, do we teach on stewardship? Honestly, do we teach on stewardship because we really do want to see you liberated financially or because we want to see you give your tithes and offerings? Right? Good question. What are our true motives for teaching you stewardship? Do, you want to see, do we want to see you free to serve God and be free in your finances to do all that God's called you to do? Or do we just want our share of it? When we, do we preach because we want to impart life to you? or because we want to just cause a, have a following, right? Wherever I go, am I trying to minister life, or do I just want people to pay attention to me? You know, I, I had one minister tell me, actually stood up and told this whole church, blew me away. He said, you know, like, you know, like, God uses me in signs and wonders and all these things, but I have to admit that I'm really in ministry because I'm really insecure and I need a following. And I'm really so glad that you're feeding that need. Well, six months later, that church no longer existed because they started to see that he wasn't there to bless them. He was there because he needed attention. He needed people to follow him. He needed people to come up after the service every Sunday and say, good word, pastor, good word, pastor. Boy, if that's our motivation, we should quit now, right? Because that's taking, right? Taking your affirmation, taking your accolades is still taking, when we disciple, do we do it because we want you to become mature or because we need someone to tell what to do? Oh, I want to disciple you because I want to 
tell you off and tell you how to become a good person that will please me according to my expectations and my, my sense of order? Or are we discipling because we want to raise other people up into the fullness that God has for them? And folks, I'm telling you, the next generation is not going to conform to our image of being a disciple. Yeah. <laughs> And we shouldn't either. But anyway, that's a whole other problem. So, do we evangelize because we can care about the condition of someone's soul or because we want to just see more people in the church on Sunday? What's our motive? See, God's wanting to put his thumb on motives in these days. Now, it doesn't mean we stop evangelizing until we make sure our motives are pure. But God is putting his finger on motives in these days. Because much motivation or much evangelism is motivated by a desire to acquire new members, not to minister to needy people. Um, and that's why I love the family fun fair. It's forcing us to bless people without any sense of gain. We need to have that broken off of us. We have to con- learn how to conduct ourselves in such a manner that the world sees us as givers, not takers. Because that's God's heart. Matthew 23, verse 15, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and see see to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. That's in the Bible. You go and win a convert, and then you lay all these rules on them and all these bad motives and all these regulations, and they're twice as worse off as you are. Who put that in there, right? (laughs) Father pleasers never respond to acquire, to possess, or control others. You know, and even Jesus refused anything that would put him in bondage. Even to the Sabbath. He says, I... Sabbath was made for me, not me for the Sabbath. See, one of our responsibilities, if we're to be a father pleaser, not only do we have to make sure that we're not trying to control, manipulate, acquire, use other people, but we also are responsible to make sure that no one lays that on us. Too many people said, oh, I was in that church and they just controlled and manipulated. Why did you let them? Really, why did you let them? You're responsible to not come into bondage. Yes, let's get free, But once you're free, you're responsible to stay free. You're not responsible to sit around and let people control your lives and then just criticize them because they controlled you. You're responsible to stay free. And say, just a minute here. I know what it's like to be in bondage. I'm never going back. It was for freedom that Christ set me free. And as a father pleaser, I please the father not only by not manipulating, controlling, or putting other people in bondage, but I refuse to become back in bondage myself, even to well-meaning rules and programs and expectations. As father pleasers, for our sake and for our children's sake, we have to intentionally get free and intentionally stay free. Number five, we need to move on quickly here. Uh, Fifth change that's coming and is in the middle of coming, uh, a changing goal from saving souls to forming sons. See, the church has become uh, obsessed with getting people into heaven rather than discovering their kingdom purpose. You know, like, oh, I, just, I, just, I just need to get into heaven. I just need to stay pure so I get into heaven. Yeah, but what has God called you to do while you're on the earth? Okay? God is going to press us into a dramatic change in our goal from getting people ready to heaven to getting people ready for earth. Okay? I thought it was... <laughs> I came across... This is bizarre. I did a, a search, a web search, just a couple words on Google, and I actually got into somebody's private Facebook um, wall-to-wall thingy, whatever you call it, just by doing a... I think it's scary. Facebook is not as secure as you may have thought it was. Anyway, since I was in... <laughs> let, me, no, let me read this. This is, this, this is really revealing of where much of the church is today. A uh, man, he's 52 years old. He's writing to this woman named Connie. Dear Connie, I'm 52 years of age. I've been divorced five years. I'm a Christian who loves God with all my heart, and my main ambition is to make heaven my final home. Does that sound spiritual? 
my main ambition is to make heaven my final home. But you know what? That's really religious, self-centered, and foolish. Because if you're a Christian and you die, it's the only place you're going to go. You don't have to make heaven your home. It is your home. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, there's no other place for you. He's going to spend the rest of his life trying to attain something he already has. Is that religiosity or what, right? Because that's what religious people do. We go stride through life struggling and straining to try to gain what God's already given us. I repent of reading that private letter. <laughs> he went on and said, <clears throat> he said, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Doesn't this sound spiritual again? No, this is where God's put me. I'm not just passing through. I'm taking ground. I'm taking up residence and I'm changing this place. Hey, I'm just passing through. No commitments, no obligations. Don't ask me to join anything. I'm just passing through. God's looking for joiners. He's looking for people to take up a standard in every city and change the culture of that city. (laughs) Folks, this modern generation can no longer be threatened by hell or bribed by heaven. I'll say it again. This present generation can no longer be threatened by hell or bribed by heaven. They're not going to respond. If you accept Jesus, you're going to get to go to heaven. So what, most people will say. That means nothing to them. If you don't accept Jesus, you're going to hell. That means nothing to most people. But when you say, God is a father who wants you to become his son or daughter and enter into a personal relationship with him, an abiding relationship where you commune each day and he shows you his purpose and your, for your life and your destiny and you'll know why you're on this earth and you make a great difference for the Lord today, for the Father today. That's attractive. That's attractive. Sonship is attractive. Look at Paul's objective. See, this is not new stuff. It's God having to bring it back as we've lost it. Look look at Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 21. For even the whole creation, all of nature, waits expectantly and longs earnestly for God's sons to be made known, waits for the revealing, the disclosing of their sonship, for the creation or nature was subjective to frailty, to futility, condemned to frustration, not because of some intentional fault on their part, but by the will of him who subjected so subjected it, yet with the hope that nature, with creation itself, will be set free from the, its bondage to decay and corruption and to gain an entrance into the glorious freedom of God's children. That's what it's all about, not heaven or hell. It's about glorious freedom of God's children. That was Paul's motivation. He didn't witness to get people out of hell. He wouldn't or keep people from hell. He witnessed to get people into freedom. And again, very quickly, we think of freedom as freedom from something, right? Oh, if I can become free, if I can just become free from drugs, I would be so well, you know, like everything would be great, or free from alcohol, or free from whatever addiction, or free from discouragement, or free from depression. That is not a biblical worldview. When God said, I want, he, when, he, when God went to Moses and he said, set my people free, he wasn't saying, get them out of Egypt. He said, get them into the promised land. Freedom is not freedom from something. Freedom is freedom into something. Okay? And God wants us to be free in our sonship and daughtership as children of God. So how to respond as a, fa- as a father pleaser? Learn to live as a son. And then, when it comes to discipleship, make sure you're helping other people learn how to be sons and daughters. If you've given people all these rules and regulations, you know, I'm a Christian now, read your Bible, go to church, witness, pray, tithe, whatever, I've just taught an old dog new tricks. Right. But if you disciple someone by bringing them into sonship, you've given them a lasting, eternal gift. Okay? Moving quickly, number six, changing emphasis from exclusion to inclus- or exclusive to inclusive. And what I mean by that is that so many of our doctrines are exclusive rather than inclusive. Jesus was always saying, call them in, call them in, bring them to the banqueting table, inclusive. But we tend to make, you know, like, are you mid-trib, post-trib, 
not, you know, like tribulation. What do you believe? We try, what do we do? We're trying to exclude certain people. Are you evangelical? Are you charismatic? Or are you just uh, conservative? What are we doing? We're excluding certain people. So much of our doctrine is just, by its very definition, is exclusive. Do you speak in tongues? Do you not speak in tongues? Sorry, you can't take communion with us because you're not one of us. I was in this church once, sitting in the front row. I, yeah, I can't, probably. I'm sitting in the front row, and and church I'd never been to before, they're coming along with the communion plate, plate, and they got beside me, they looked at me, and put their arm right around me, and gave it to the person beside me, made sure I did not partake. I went, oh, I went to take one. They grabbed my hand and pulled it back. This is a true story. I was a Christian, I think, about two years at that time, and I actually believe that now that I was a Christian, we're all one in Christ. And I went to another part of my family, another church, another denomination, and found out that I was totally rejected by them. I was not one of them. And yet, so many doctrines are exclusive, not inclusive. In this new move, God is going to challenge us to examine all of our doctrines in terms of its ability to lead people into the Father and into sonship. And we're going to, we're going to let go of some things because they're counterproductive to getting people into relationship with the Father and Sonship. Now, I'm not saying like, like, like the fundamentals are still the fundamentals. There's only one access to the Father, right? Jesus is really the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by him. But there's so many other little pet peeve doctrines that are so divisive to the, to the church, okay? John, look at John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40. You guys diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you can possess eternal life. But these are the scriptures that testify about me, Jesus, and yet you refuse to come to me and, receive, and have life. So they were using their doctrine, or their scriptures, their doctrine, to keep people from knowing the very person the scriptures were talking about. The very scriptures they were using to keep themselves doctrinally pure kept them from God and from God's love. God wants to teach us how to learn in, how to walk in love, not walk in doctrine. Okay. I really need to move on. Um, doctrines are important, but we have to re-examine doctrines in the light of do they lead people to the Father. Have we misunderstood certain doctrines and, and, and made them into divisive issues rather than ones that would include people, you know, all that may... Remember back in the 70s, Chuck Smith, the whole hippie movement, people were coming to Jesus, and the, all these hippies were coming into church on Sunday, and the board of the one church actually locked the doors of the church so none of these hippies could get into church. Right? It, it's, people are coming to Jesus. But you have a doctrine that says if you have long hair or beads or earrings or body piercings, <laughs> you can't come in. Wow. No, okay. Father pleasers know how to walk in love, not walk in doctrine. Number seven, last thing. We are going to have to change, or God is going to force us to change our understanding of the end times from events to the concept of one new man. What I mean by that? Um, we're always looking, we're trying to, we always look at our end times theology and doctrine in terms of uh, uh, certain events on the earth. And those are just signposts. They're not the real issue. The real issue is about this thing called the one new man. You see, in the Bible, there are actually, scripturally, five transitional people in the Bible. Adam, right, from the Garden of Eden into the sin of the world. Well, he was a transitional figure. Um, who else we have there? Abraham, the father of faith, right? He was a transitional figure from before Judaism to the, the, uh, pe being, becoming the children of Israel. We had Moses, the giver of the law, the law and the prophet. The law came out of him. He was a transitional figure the, he, that he brought us the whole law of the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus came and gave us the, as not only Messiah and Savior, but he also gave us a new covenant, the New Testament. But there's another figure in the Bible people miss, and that figure's called the one new man. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. For he himself is our peace. Jesus is our peace. He has made the two, the Jew and Gentile, or Jew and non-Jew, one, and he has destroyed the barrier dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh 
the law and its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body, this one new man, to reconcile both Jew and non-Jew to God through the cross. Okay? And in Colossians 1.27, to them, to the Christians, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, plurality, Christ in you, plural, the hope of glory. So what is the Bible saying here? The Bible says that God is in the process in these days of making this one new man. He's a corporate person in whom God wants to abide. God wants to form us into one new man. That's man and women together. No more Jew nor Gentile. No more, no more Baptist or Pentecostal. No more this or that. One new man, okay? He wants to create one new body. It's like, oh man, I'm so tempted to go certain places. But anyway, okay. 2,000 years later, we're still struggling over this one new man. We've still got, we got more divisions than ever, right? And we find ourselves very uncomfortable trying to embrace this one new man. I was talking to a minister recently, and I said, oh, you're doing these pastors' gatherings? This is awesome. So this is all the pastors. He said, well, no, not all the pastors. He said, I, you know, like those non-spirit-filled guys, I have no, no need, for, no place for them. I went, What? He said, no, if you're not spirit-filled, I just have no time of day for you. I go, no, you've missed it still. There is one new man. The one new man is maturing, is progressing, but he's still supposed to be one new man. Not these and those, uh, ins and outs, us and them. There's one new man, right? We will never see a complete expression of the glory of the kingdom until we embrace the one new man, which means everybody in this room has given their lives to Jesus Christ, but also everybody in the churches down the road. They're part of the one new man. If we can't pray together or at least be nice to each other, we're, we've lost, we, like, we have missed out on so much. There are 600 million spirit-filled Christians alive on the earth today. 600 million spirit-filled Christians, but there are also 900 million other Christians who are not yet considered spirit-filled. What if for the next 10 years, while we're looking to the heavens and waiting for Jesus to return, what if God's goal for the next 10 years is not to come again, but to make these 1.5 billion Christians into one new man? And we're so busy looking up, we totally miss what God's trying to do on the earth. You know, what would happen if those 1.5 billion people actually became one? We would take the earth in an instant. Maybe God desires to come in his saints before he comes to his saints. Just a thought. Maybe he desires to come in his saints before he desires to come for his saints. What if he desires to manifest himself in the church before he desires to manifest himself in the clouds? And we're looking up to the clouds, but God's down here trying to manifest himself, bring us into one new man. So perhaps we should stop looking upward and start looking outward and inward, right? Okay, we're way over. Okay, bottom line. Revelation chapter 11, verse 17. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who was, I'm sorry, who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and you've begun to reign. You've begun to reign. But before he reigns over the earth, he has to first reign in his church. But he's only really allowed to reign when the church is filled with father pleasers. Because in father pleasers always say yes to the father. Our goal is to please the father, not protect our pet doctrines, not to keep things the way they are, not try to live in the level of comfort, not try to trust in God's sovereignty, but to come into a personal relationship with him and live each day for him and seek only to please him. God is pushing and pressing us not to punish us, but because he wants to transition us from that place of his sovereignty to that place of his providence where we know him each and every day as Father. And then enjoy that abiding, unbroken, unending relationship with him every day of our lives. John eight twenty nine. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him.
Wow. Wouldn't that be an awesome testimony? Well, not everybody's my friend. I'm not popular in some circles, but you know what? I always do those things that please the Father. And I'm completely fulfilled and satisfied in that. That's the type of person that fulfills their destiny. That's the type of person that God can use. Let's just close our head, hand, or close whatever. Close something. Close your eyes for a moment, not your ears. Okay. Close your eyes for a moment. Um, if, 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 if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, all I can say today is that God wants you to know Him as Father. He wants you to know Him as Father. He wants you to experience what it means to be a son or daughter of God. Yes, you have to give up ownership of your life. Yes, you have to start, stop running your own life and let him run your life, but it's going to be so much better than what you want. So if you've never given your life to the Lord, just say today, Dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Please forgive me of running my own life. Today I realize you are not against me. You are for me. You want to come to me and be known as my Father. And so I willfully give my life to you. I ask forgiveness of my sins. I ask you to save me and transform me by your Spirit. Holy Spirit, come into my life right now and begin to transform me in this amazing process called sonship. Today, I choose to give my life to the Father and become a son or daughter of God. I pray that in Jesus' name. And if you already know the Father as Father, or I already know the Father as your Savior, I'd invite you today to know Him as Father. I invite you today to say, Lord God, today I choose to move from your realm of sovereignty to your realm of fatherly care. I I choose to move from that place where all you are is creator and ruler, and I choose to move into that place where I can know you as Father each and every day of my life. I submit to that today. I invite you to come into my life as Father today and now teach me how to be your son. Teach me how to be your daughter. That's my prayer for these next days, weeks, and months. Teach me how to be a son or daughter father of the Father who gives pleasure to the Father. I pray that in Jesus' name. And all of us said, Amen.